Welcome to A Canadian Investing in the U.S., a podcast and YouTube channel focused on Canadians buying real estate with host Glenn Sutherland. Welcome to a new episode of Canadian Investing in the U.S. with Glenn Sutherland. Uh, This week, I just want to take the opportunity to introduce you to my other podcast once again. uh, We covered a topic that I thought would be I mean, honestly, I just thought it was a really good topic and it was a good conversation about the Burr method and the pluses and the minuses to it. And instead of like trying to, you know, redo the whole thing, I thought, let's just, you know, show you some episodes from my other podcast. And honestly, um, there is some amazing content in the other podcasts. So I do encourage you to reach out and uh, find Advanced Real Estate Investing Talk on wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple or Google Play or Spotify, wherever, wherever your, your preference is. But anyway, it's out there on all of them. It is not on YouTube as well. It is not on YouTube, though. It is only a, an audio version for, for the other podcast. Anyway, so without further ado, I will let Ari uh, get this thing started. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Advanced Real Estate Investing Talk. This is Aurelia. I'm here with Glenn, glennsutherland.com and Darcy, darcywhite.ca. Today, we'll be discussing a topic that came up during um, the event we had here in London. Uh, I organized an in-person real estate investing event to give back. You know, real estate was good to me, so I want to create opportunities for others to uh, benefit from real estate investing. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that I found was pretty good was, is the birth strategy a glorified house of cards? Okay, we have to define what the Burr strategy is. If someone's just the dropping Burr in, the strategy means yeah. buy, renovate, rent out, refinance, repeat. So basically, you invest money in a property, you improve the value of the property, you add value to this property, and then you refinance, taking equity out your initial investment to put down to the next one, and so on. So that's the idea of a house of card where you put things together and starting with uh, the first property and then you grow a portfolio that way yeah and house of cards just for clarification is slang for something that's loosely built like imagine a child putting together a little structure out of playing cards you could blow it over with a breath so this person i'm presuming is thinking i'm kind of skeptical i don't know that this will work tell me if this is uh bs or not or if this is risky or that was a question i think we could argue this both ways um (laughs) <laughs> you know, oh, I, that'd be interesting. Yeah, I, I think we could argue this both ways because just like high level, you could say if you refinance this property and strip all the equity out, um, a way a lender is going to look at it is the risk is going to be higher, obviously, yeah. um, yeah. and that's why your interest rates are going to change and your leverage is going to change on a cash out refi. Um, but the other part of it is your cash flow is going to get a lot worse, right? Your payments are going to go up. You know, your carrying costs are going to go up. Um, by doing the refinance, because you're probably taking on a higher debt load and a higher uh, uh, interest rate, right? So you're going to change just the the whole note of how it's how it's running our mortgage. Um, so uh, you know that is a, a risk. Right? Yeah. Could, could you put I some numbers like, to that? Go ahead. Yeah, right like any business decision, you know there are risks involved, and there are ways to mitigate risk. So in that case, and the person actually has asked, you know. What if, what if, how much loan to value should I take out? And this is, should be based on numbers and you should tr- stress test the property with vacancy rates, uh, with interest rates to make sure that you have uh, a cushion and, and then you don't take too much money out. You know, uh, ideally you take out what you put in. So that's the ideal scenario, or you can take a little bit more or you take a little bit less, but you, you make sure that. The, um, the income with some uh, margin for uh, vacancy and interest rate raising uh, services the debt that you have enough money from income after you pay the expenses to pay back the mortgage, even if the mortgage rates increase so that you have a, you, you, you're, you're covered because the birth strategy is essential. So the, 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 Official name, I think, was coined by uh, Bigger Pockets, someone at Bigger Pockets, maybe Brendan Turner or uh, or David Green, one of them. And and it's a it's a way of creating wealth, you know, because you and it's a way of creating a portfolio of properties. Yep. And that's assuming that the property is cash flow. So you need you need to really make sure that you cash flow. So you need to be very specific, very um 
very clear on your numbers and uh, and you need to do a proper underwriting and, and look at your financial very seriously. Well, what yeah. you just said there is key, right? Because um, I've had properties where they um, appraised higher than we expected. We've done, we did better than we planned on the renovation push. Um, and sometimes greed will set in. You're like, hey, we can get out more than we even put in. So yeah. it's called a perfect burr when you get all of your money back, but you can do yeah. sometimes better than a perfect burr. And yeah. you, if you sit back and you do the underwriting correctly, you look at the numbers, you'll realize that if you do this, it might make your property, because I've done enough, I have enough experience in this, it might make the cash flow, it's still cash flows, but it's low to a point where I can anticipate my partner is not excited about that much cash flow. Getting $200 a month um, may not be exciting enough. And in the future, it might force a sale because they're going to change their mind that they even want to keep it. So if you just say the lender might offer you to be, a, be able to do these really high refinances, but it, you have to sit, take a step back and go, no, let's just take out what we put in or just take out even less than we put in, leave some money in the deal so that it actually cash flows and we can actually do this long term. Darcy, you look like you were about to say something before. Yeah, I think I, now this is, you know, for listeners, this is exactly what Glenn does. Um, if we were to put some numbers to this, say, for instance, he buys a house and we'll make them easy. Buys a house for $50,000. He puts $20,000 of renovation in. He's 70 in. He gets it refinanced. He gets a valuation of 100000 based on rents of 1% of that. So $1,000 a month, which is not unreasonable. Yeah. These are workable numbers. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting about 1% of your gross on rent. You've got refinance at six and a half percent right now, maybe, maybe if you're good, uh, maybe a little higher, but it just depends. But say that's twelve thousand a year in just interest, so you're, um, or twelve thousand a year in income, and your mortgage is principal and interest, both property tax and insurance. You might get your whole hundred grand out, all your money and more. Seventy grand, but out. you only put seventy. Yeah, in. you only put seventy in, right? And you got to appraise it at hundred, and they put it at eighty percent, and you get an extra 10 grand in your pocket, but you got something that's got very, very thin cash flow. That be after the 12,000 in rent you're getting, your expenses are close to 10. So maybe you're getting $2,000 uh, above that in a year. And like Glenn says, your partner's going, What am I going to do with 180 bucks a month? This isn't worth it. It's not worth it. Why don't we just sell it? Um, your risk is really high. And then this way, I think the Ari's questioner is right. If you have a bunch of these that you've done, a whole pile of them, not just one, but you've been fortunate and you found a bunch of them. Um, you have a bunch of these. They're all technically cash flowing. They're all cash positive. You've taken your money out, your investment capital out and a premium on it, but you have very little cash flow. If something goes sideways, you know, vacancies, maybe you account for them right now. They're low at most places, but that might not always be the case. And what if you have some, some problem, a leak, groundwater, city drains, Things like that that leave it vacant for three or four months while you rent it, fix in that, and you got an insurance cost and an insurance deductible. Now you're underwater in one of them, and then you're putting money, you're feeding money from B property into A property, and maybe here's the house of cards things where everything starts to affect the first one. And if one of those cards in that little structure is pulled out, the whole thing falls. And Ari's, Ari's guy is right. Too much of a if you cut these things too thinly and you're too aggressive. There are too many dependent variables for this to be a very safe investment. Um, your risk is your measurement of you know what your idea and your execution and your cash flow over time. And the longer you lengthen the timeline, the more that these variables come to play. So yeah, I would say that you could, if you were very aggressive and you were stuck in there for a long enough time, this could, it could be a house of cards. Removing one or two from it um, could result in the whole structure falling apart. I think you have to be super careful. Hello, everybody. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that I've created a new coaching program. I believe the new coaching program has way more value than any of the programs that have even existed in the past. What we've done is pre-recorded all the lessons so that you can work through it at your own pace, which is pretty cool. And then we're going to meet up on a regular basis to answer the questions, do deal analysis, and actually spend our time together working on things instead of spending our time learning things. 
I think this will make a seamless transition to buying in the United States and will help you solve a lot of your problems. If this is of interest to you, go to glensutherland.com slash coaching. I hope to help you guys invest in the United States and I hope we provide as much value as possible. Back to the podcast. Yep. I think, yeah, and I think you need to, uh, like uh, Darcy said, you know, you need to, uh, it's very important you know, underwriting to factor in, you know, capital expenditures like uh, a sewer line can be expensive. Uh, so try to uh, estimate the, I have a document that estimates the lifespan of different uh, items, you know, for mm -hmm. an apartment, um, an, an, an apartment building. And then you factor those in in your underwriting so that you cover yourself. So with capital expenditures that we not necessarily use to underwrite. And then it's very important also, if your tenant stops paying, I I invest typically in provinces or states where the laws uh, are strict in terms of uh, rent payment. So you can still make money and be successful investing in real estate in other provinces or states, but then you need to be very very careful when you screen your tenants. That's where you that's a skill you really need to uh, to master. Uh, so that you make sure that you have good tenants that are going to pay the rent and uh, not trash the place. So I think knowledge, education, you learn from experience. And like you, like they say, you know, the intelligent investor or the intelligent person uh, learn learns from their mistake and the wise person learns from others' mistakes. So um, yeah, be, be cautious when underwriting. Uh, even think of pests, you know, have a line item for pests because pests can happen, mice, uh, uh, cockroaches, stuff like that. So, so I have, um, in what going back to Darcy's thing, when you're talking about uh, one issue happens, you pull one, one property out has a big mm -hmm. problem with it, which just could, you know, an air conditioner gets stolen, it's four thousand dollars. You only have a small cash flow in each one, and it just strips the whole portfolio, right? As they're all put yep. together. Right. Um, what I've done, because I love the burst strategy. Um, I think the burst strategy is a great way to grow your portfolio, to grow your wealth. Um, but like with everything, um, diversification is the ultimate, you know, um, he, he, everyone who talk, talk stocks, mutual funds, whatever their thing is, it's always diversify. So what I like to do is not be, even though I love this strategy, uh, I do it a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be working with other strategies at the same time. Um, that's the way I look at it. So what yeah. I usually will recommend um, to students is like, hey, yeah, go do, go do a few burrs if you want to, right? And you'll, you know, you have, you collect some properties. Um, but where I like to do is do a flip every once in a while, get that cash. And what I spend that cash on typically is properties that don't refinance very well, that maybe are too cheap for lenders that lenders don't like, and then they keep some in cash, right? And then if you're 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 diversifying. So now you have a few properties that cash flow a thousand dollars a month or five hundred dollars, whatever your number is, um, and you have a higher cash from those. But you don't have any refinanceability with those. The only way to get really out is to sell them, right? There's high cash flow properties, which you cannot build your portfolio on because you'll run out of money, right? Yep. Or even, or you're just using private money and it's really not, um, it's not a good scalable method anyway. You need to diversify, right? So take profit from flips, do it in that, get some, have some cash flow properties that are just high in cash flow used because they're going to get sunk. That money's going to get sunk. Use profit for sunk money. And other money you want to keep it turning with the bourbon with it. Yeah. So other sport fan, can I use a sports metaphor here? Recent sure. one, like Sunday we watched um, the 49ers, which my brother loves because he. I thought for Sunday sure you were going to talk about the Canucks just because they're so oh so, so good. <laughs> anyway, anyway, no, but my brother loves the 49ers. I like any team that is playing the 49ers. I just sorry about that, and I love the story about the Detroit Lions. Uh, you know, my listeners will know I did a lot of work in Windsor. The, the football team that I have seen the most live is Detroit. And my lawyer, Jerry, may be listening this morning, um, has season tickets and graciously took me to uh, Lions games. I love what the Lions have done over the last four years with this leadership group. I love Dan Campbell. I love how aggressive he is. I love their coaching. And because he's so aggressive and he is so um, uh, uh, willing to take risks, and he's got the backing of the ownerships uh, and his general manager and his players. They got to the championship game this year, not the Super Bowl, though, and that's what's important. Yeah. By taking 
um, qualified risks and sometimes would say unqualified risks. The Lions had an unbelievable season and turned around what has been so miserable since Barry Sanders has retired uh, retired early. Uh, a, a great team, right? But it's smart sometimes to take some chips off the table and to back off. Not every strategy is going straight pedal to the metal, balls to the wall in every circumstance. They should have kicked on fourth and two. They should have kicked both times. They had an opportunity to take three points, stay in the game and stay up by 17 or three scores. They didn't. And they failed both times to uh, achieve that fourth down. It's too risky. You have to have some, you know, we have to figure out where you are in the cycle and measure risk. And I think Ooh. sometimes we do a really good job of, of risk, but sometimes we get caught up in the game. And I think in this case, um, Dan Campbell got caught up in the game. What got him there was really good, but what gets you there doesn't always keep you there. And at some point when you have skin in the game for real, the smart strategy is to make sure you can still play tomorrow. Or in this case, the Lions should have been in the Super Bowl. They had they had the other they had uh, the 49ers on the ropes. They should have been in the Super Bowl. This was a tragic mistake, and they gave life to the 49ers, and then now you're done. Now I have to listen to my brother for two weeks talk about the 49ers. And that is my cross to bear. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's here's here's a takeaway lesson. Yes, you know, to Ari's, or I think to Ari's um uh a questioner yeah it can be if you're too aggressive you're not uh, if you're not measuring your risk carefully um if you're too greedy um yeah it could be a house of cards you could lose it off of one mistake and that would be a tragedy you don't want to do that i worked um or i was having a conversation with someone who was a coach yeah. years ago uh, I think it, they were on my podcast, I think three years ago. Just, Football coach or real estate coach? Real estate coach. Okay. Real estate just coach. Yeah. Real estate coach. And they said that they, a student came on and wanted them to fix their portfolio. And they had, I think it was 20 or 30 burrs that they had in their portfolio. Wow. And they wanted to figure out how to make them cash flow because they couldn't retire from their job. And they had 20 or 30 properties because they'd been so aggressive and stripped all the money out and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and every they take as much as they could possibly get every single time so that they could buy maybe one and a half properties every time right and it just kept growing and growing um mm -hmm. but they didn't think about the long game and i think ari's point with the underwriting being conservative thinking about the future what your actual goal you're trying to accomplish is yeah. and are you going to the just collecting properties may not be what your goal is you know it's likely the cash flow or the what the lifestyle that the cash flow or the time that the cash flow could provide to you is really mm -hmm. what you're looking for and um you just need to keep the greed on the on the low level and think about what your actual strategy is yeah yeah yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, looking at uh, what your long-term goals are, and and start there, and then and then build your strategy based on that. Yeah, you know, like... great. Nice okay, well, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, thank you for the question. We are delighted to answer questions on the show. Hopefully, those answers uh, were helpful. We were uh, happy to help, and uh, feel free to send us our questions. Send us your questions. Advanced REI talk at gmail.com. Advanced REI talk at gmail.com. Thanks for tuning in. You can see, you can follow uh, Glenn, glennsutherland.com. He has a course about investing in the US. And Darcy, darcywhite.ca, um, has a blog where he shares his thoughts, goes a little deeper than um, his contributions uh, on, the, on the podcast. So thank you for tuning in and see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. That was a nice video. Bye.